the seven sacraments, and I'm very much a seven guy. Um, seven sacraments, not a crap shooter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> are great and wonderful and good and holy that there may be, there may be that the greatest sacrament is whatever's going on in the present moment. You know, and that but for those of us who don't often have the opportunity to elevate and break, um, I really only elevate, well, I hardly ever elevate and break, even here, because it's better that somebody else should do it. Um, you know, I kind of low break on the slide. But um, I don't think that means we're not sacramental. I think sometimes we're, we're we offer a camouflaged sacrament, and by that I mean they can't see it coming. I used to, I knew in a, a seminary in an Episcopal church, he said he'd already purchased his mitre and it was camouflaged because he didn't want them to see it coming. <laughs> um, but there's, there's really powerful and I think transformative stuff that we're able to do, sometimes because we don't have the collar on, or maybe because we do and yet the perception. We're not their pastor. So we're not going to tell on them, you know, or report it back to the appropriate authorities. And I think it's maybe when those, maybe that's a long-winded way to say when, when whomever we're working with lets their guard down, and when we're not preoccupied with what it is we're doing and are more interested in just responding authentically, that the most powerful and transformative stuff happens and we may not notice it till we get home and find ourselves exhausted. But I think it's part of our call to name the powers, to name, to name what's going on. And, um, and that's, and, 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 and what you just talked about, in many cases, and what everybody's talked about so far, may be largely unavailable to the person who identifies with the collar, gets to stand and, you know, you know you get to humbly walk at the end of the procession coming in and going out, but until for the rest of the time you're sit, sitting up on a platform above everybody. Um, and I think a lot becomes unavailable. So maybe the gift in, the, in having to bear with the questions that we bear um, is that those moments of finding the holy in the desecrated places. I once thought, <coughs> probably still think, uh, that the best Catholic priest would be the one who is deaf and blind and mute. He's the one I can go to confession and just unload. And if, if, if to whatever extent that is true, if we can be the deaf, or blind, and mute priest, deacon, whatever, uh, we would be more welcomed. And can we do that? Even if we have all of our senses, as I said, can I struggle enough to let my ego out of it to say, oh, yeah, don't worry, I have an answer for that. Um, but if he had a Braille Facebook connection, <laughs> to paraphrase on the cartoon that's going around, where the priest is in the confessional, he has the computer terminal, and the penitent says, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And the priest says, oh, don't bother, I've seen it all on Facebook <laughs> already. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought about Alice's restaurant. Uh, the the um, where uh, he says, uh, and they go to court, and they have the thirty-seven pictures of uh, with arrows and daggers explaining each picture. Uh, but the judge is blind and can't see the pictures. Is in a case of uh, American blind justice. So, <laughs> uh, I have a lawyer. Yeah. In, in the trial, we present the, the picture of uh, the suspect. The accused. And he goes, that's not him. That's it. That's not him. Okay. Who is it? I don't know. It's not him. Looks like him. It's not him. What are we doing with this cartoon? Man? It's the jury's problem. Yeah. And in, in the interest of, of not having my taking up the whole afternoon, but I want to kind of just focus on a couple of things here that you've identified where your call has brought you. And where is it? Where is the sanctuary? Where is the, where is your diner in the desert? Where is your place where the, where the bread and the wine are lifted up? Where is it? And 
you know, for, for me, it's Fridays at Fat Fellows. <laughs> and I'll tell you a little bit about the group when we get there, but I sit in silence most of the time because I don't pack the gear to be able to add to the conversation all the time. And these are some pretty, pretty smart people, and I get to, they, my job is to bring them together at the table. And that's what, that's what I do. Um, so where is the, where is your sanctuary? Yours is the, in the insurance office, or has been in the insurance well, office, or? now, as a chaplain at Beacons, yeah. mine is at, in the home, in the, the bedside. In the home, in the hospice, in the, in the, the uh, neurotic neighbor's uh, living room. In my, in my dining room, my dining room. On the streets. Jerry, you got probably the more, most conventional looking thing of any of us, right? I know, it's getting boring. Yeah, well, there you go. So, uh, all right. Let her fill your cup with something kind, eggs and toast like bread and wine. I've broken into tears at that line, sitting in churches. Mm -hmm. Eggs and toast like bread and wine. It's what the little old man who sits with his wife for six years and she can't talk to him. Um, it is eggs and toast. And it is communion. They are community. It is church. Um, and the question is, for what does your community hunger? If they come to you for food, for sustenance, if they come to you for company, if they come, whatever they come to you for, what is it that they seek? It's, it's very easy, I think, you know, again, the, the typical ordained <coughs> priest on Sunday they're coming to church, we'll put on church for them. You know, the music director will have music and, you know, we'll have kitty sermon and they're coming for communion. Even if they're coming for communion, just to presume that just that that need is met just through the doing of whatever it is they're doing, the, the sacramental presence. But we're not quite so lucky at being able to check that off the list. What do your people hunger for? And they come. And how is it you, in your poverty, can give them anything? But yet you do. Um, the wants and wounds of the human race sit face to face when you come in from the cold. Well, I've been lucky up here in Wisconsin to only see pleasant weather. I keep saying in February, this probably is not where I want to be. Next year. Yeah. In February. Next year in February. <laughs> <laughs> um, but people come in from all kinds of cold, from being abandoned, from being hurt, from being in places or in associations they can't get out of. To yeah. those people. I'm sure it happened to you, I'm sure it happens to a lot, the thought, I can't keep doing this, and yet I have to keep doing this. It's not in the rules for me to not do this anymore. Uh, just the operation, to be, to be, I mean, when I think about the things that compromise me, the credit card bills, or the, the, the habits, or whatever that restrict my freedom, well, that's the call. That's the call. People on the street literally feeling the call. Uh, in what ways do we offer pathways to transparency and reconciliation? Are we there? Are we providing space, providing liturgy, providing something that allows that to happen? Arthur lets his Earl Grey steep. They tried everything, but it took her in the end. Most people don't want to sit in the presence of hopeless situations. You know, uh, doctors pretty much are finished with business with you when the insurance codes run out, when the prognosis is being blessed, uh, when the prognosis is uh, is not good. Uh, the relationship breaks off. And that's where we stand. That's where you offer a cup of water. What difference does it make to give a cup of water to a dying person who's going to be dead anyway? It means everything. It means everything. You know, my, uh, my 
dad's older brother, my uncle, passed away, uh, I don't know, sometime last year, I can't remember. And, um, and he, you know, he couldn't drink anything that was acid or anything that would disrupt him, whatever. And uh, my godfather, my dad's younger brother, because uh, they were in Mexico, Mexico City, I uh, went to go see him one day, and he, he said, he goes, man, you know, I looked at your uncle, and I knew he was going to be gone, you know, I knew he was going to be gone. He's like, so, you know, and now me, me and my godfather, we resemble each other quite well, physically, we, we you know, I could pass for his, his son, um, but, you know, I told my mom the other day, I'm like, I'm talking to her about something. I said, Look, listen, stop worrying about it. I'm a criminal at heart. I know what I'm doing. Don't worry about this, you know? And I hate to say it that way, but, you know, it's, it's I don't want to say rebel because it's, it doesn't, that doesn't really, you know, uh, encompass it, right? So, so my uncle's a bit of a criminal himself <laughs> in the sense that he stepped out he, and the nurse was like, are you going to come back? You know, there are rules and regulations for hospital visiting is, is really off, off, off-handed. And, and he goes, yeah, oh, I just need to catch some hair. I'm very emotional. I'll be back. And he runs downstairs across the street and he buys, buys my uncle a can of Coke. Uh, 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 because my uncle loved Coke and, and he comes back and, and they actually check you uh, to make sure you're not bringing food from the outside. Wow. And, uh, and he, he said he cuffed it in his, in his coat where his pockets at, where he had his hand. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, so he, he walks in and, and he said he, he, that, like he, he has a big belly. And, he, and he, he said, he goes, I was just acting like I was rubbing my belly. And they're like, are you okay? He said, oh, no, it's just some guy bumped into me. Oh, man, he, you know, he had a briefcase and he hit me. And so they didn't check his pocket because he's distracting them. And they're like, well, okay, as long as you don't have it. No, no, it's oh, man. To be okay, yeah, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. <laughs> Walks in and, and opens it, wakes my uncle up, and cracks it open. He goes, Here, drink. And he died the next day. You know, and he gave him that last joy. He goes, he goes Oh, I can tell your uncle was, was loving it because he'd take a sip and, you know, he was just, just enjoying it, you know. He goes, I had to give the old man one. One last drink, you know, mm-hmm. and and my dad and him don't get along very well, uh, but I told him I said that's probably the most holy thing you could have done for him. Sure, that is communion. That's right. a right. thing. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's so. Our week and our work as priests and deacons, and whatever times we want to give ourselves, are we, are we able to serve the needs of the brokenhearted and the broken? Are we places of, that are, are we able to be with people who suffer? Uh, Kevin swears he's leaving quality control for the Chicago scene. Are we a people in a place that that support dreams and hopes, and can we can we let people define themselves, or are we are we somehow messengers that say you don't have to be trapped by your credit cards or your race or your sexuality or whatever it is? If you have dreams, we need to be a place where we can talk about those dreams. Kevin studies here after work. Is and this is coming against too hard or something. Is UAC a place for growth, for reflection, for um, for formation? Interestingly and briefly, yes. One of the most successful, productive things we've done at Compassion at Heart is we started a book study. Good. And some people came in through the book study. Mm-hmm. You know. That's yeah. I'll move it along here. Emma uh, leaned and kissed his cheek. 
How do we support commitment and loving relationships? Well, I think we certainly do. I think the marriage ministries that, that are here uh, are part of that. But just the openness and the radical inclusion. You know, we're not going to tell you who you can love and who you can't love. Uh, they may well be part of it. Uh, look to heaven or just sit with, sit with us, community. You know, come and just be with us. That's, that's the invitation. Really. Uh, Deeper invites her lip and frowns. Tristan comes along sometime. How are we able to meet the needs of a wide variety of people and situations? Do we think about that? And just as you reflect on your own ministry. Um, Veda used to drink a lot. Michael toured Saigon and back, heads bowed and hands are clasped. One more, what was it? One more something has passed. I forgot what it is. But another serious situation, another calamity they were facing has passed. Are we places, again, of forgiveness, restoration, thanksgiving? Remember, are we celebration? Are we able to celebrate the passage of events? One more storm. Yeah. I had one more storm. One more storm. Has yeah. passed. One more storm has passed. Um, and then Miranda works the late night counter. In what ways can we re recognize and ordain the Miranda priests amongst us in our midst? Um, how can we confer not so much, you know, the, all the hand signs and gestures and magic words, but how, I mean, I think I did it with the waitresses at the restaurant. When you do this, when you do it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. And I think they heard that. Um, just real quickly. Here's Fat Phelps. All right. Little place in Newport, North Carolina. And there's Miranda up there in the corner. Her name's Danielle. Spelled in a typical Southern tradition, D-A-N-Y-E-L-L. -L, Danielle. Um, <laughs> The, the guys at the table, you see me sitting there. I'll just tell you very briefly, uh, the one guy closest is a, uh, a, a student of one of the other fellows who teaches at the community college. And this, this guy is uh, suffering from PTSD, and he comes to the table every once in a while. The guy sitting next to him uh, is a former uh, 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 colonel in the Air Force, I mean, not the Air Force, the Marine Corps, sorry. I'll never live down the Marine Corps, uh, retired, uh, went to art school, and now he's, he's an artist and, uh, and has a long ponytail and a beard, and uh, his friends with the Marine Corps don't recognize him anymore. Uh, the guy leaning in the back, leaning over, is a uh, 20 something, 20 odd something former fundamentalist, Calvinist, Reformation theology uh, guy, went to Liberty University. Uh, oh who is uh, now an atheist. Uh, and uh, he and one of the other fellows, uh, uh, guy sitting next to guy sitting up the front here with the beard, is uh, they're both uh, very vociferous atheists and feel welcome and able to be in this group and to like whatever they want. Uh, there's me, whatever I am. The guy sitting next to me is a guy that was a former diplomat to China. Um, and got in trouble with Paul Wolfowitz uh, at the Bush administration, and they wound up sending him to federal prison uh, for basically the same stuff with, with the, the emails, the Hillary Clinton emails, and, and the, the Petraeus thing, uh, except his was much less, and he did prison time. Um, pretty smart guy. Speaks fluent Chinese, should be able to, need to order out. Uh, the guy in the back with the uh, with the, um, the, the vest on is a, an investment counselor who's facing uh, bankruptcy. <laughs> and, and so it goes. It's everybody has their story. Everybody is somebody, but they're not who they would seem to be. And I think that's what draws them to that table every Friday, most every Friday. Um, and I'm there because people show up and I want to be with the crowd. Uh, so, so that's, that's the restaurant, and um, 
I think each of us have a Betty's restaurant. Each of us maybe are a Betty's restaurant. And I'll just, um, a couple more slides and we'll be done. To retrieve a vision of the world as whole through sustained attention to the underlying unity that connects all beings. I heard us talking that yesterday. To one another and to the root causes in our thought and practice that contribute to the deepening fragmentation of self-community in the world. That we are part of the solution and we are part of the problem as well. But underneath it all, we're all connected. We're all connected. Um, you mentioned the, one of the first rule of new monasticism is to inhabit the abandoned places. To go places and, and be community where everybody's heading out of town, we're heading in town. Uh, and wherever that is. Whatever that looks like. How have you, how, how have those you encounter been abandoned or excluded from community and hospitality? Recognize that you are called to them and they are called to you, and it is in that brokenness, and it's not going to be found at, you know, uh, St. Moneybags on the Hill. It may be, I mean, those people need ministry too, but we're in a unique place be able to go in the other direction. Do we in the UAC have the tools, skills, and vision to reclaim and reestablish places of comfort and community for others? I think we're continuing to work on that. This, this GA has been one where there's been a, I think, a, a seismic shift in focus of some kind. Something, something's going on, and I don't know what it is, but it has to do with reclaiming, restoring, rebuilding. Um, in your particular ministries, what remains to be reclaimed? Are there things that you can re... Do you have to reinvent the wheel or can you just polish the table, paint the room? Uh, what do you need to grow this vision through your own calling? Are we a community that has avenues to support one another? How can we do that better? How can we communicate? How can we, even just prayer requests, how do you do it? Um, and then, how can we support each other in the UAC in being a place of healing, refuge, restoration, and spiritual growth? That's the same question, basically. So anyway, that's what my presentation was. And, uh, and here it is. Thank you. Thank you. Talk a little bit about my mixed feelings about this. Um, this is actually my least favorite Carrie Newcomer song. Um, and part of the reason for that has to do with, well, so my mixed feelings kind of come from the. I heard once somebody said once that the most sacred words ever, the most sacred words are I've never told anyone else this. Right? And on some level or another, I agree with that, right? I mean, I, and, but, I've heard those words all my life, right? The I've never told anyone else this. Yeah. People, people have told me something and that's I've, I haven't told anyone else. And in some cases, I know they never told anyone else after either, you know. Um, and I do think those are sacred moments. I do think those are holy moments, right? Um, but I don't need to be ordained for that, right? Um, and I also personally wouldn't call that ministry. In, in, because for me, ministry should at least, on, and again, this is my own definition, it should at least contain that question that we brought up a couple days ago, where is God in this, right? Mm -hmm. um, so for example, in, in your, in your story, what your uncle did, I think, was genuinely sacred and holy. What I think was ministry was when you told him it was holy. I mean, if you see this distinction, I mean, on some level or another, I mean, that, that's my understanding of it. That's, and that's why I kind of have mixed feelings about this kind of just being compassionate, just being loving, just being... I mean, I think that's what we're all called to be, ultimately, just as human beings. So the question is, what are what are we what are we in addition called to be as ministers? And and at least for me, that's the sort of question within these mixed feelings. 
So, would it? Oh, go ahead. Um, can you if I'm getting into too specialized? Um, <laughs> Careful. say that God has to be explicitly named or identified in order for it to be ministry? I'm, I'm just confused. I'm trying to... Yeah, I think it's less... I, well, certainly there have been ministerial situations where explicitly naming God in a certain kind of way would just destroy the whole thing, right? Right. I'm aware of that. Okay. Um, what, what I'm trying... What I was... How I was what I was trying to say is that, you know, the, the question that came up two days ago, where is God in this, mm -hmm. right? That, that, that that question on some level, whether it's explicit or implicit, mm -hmm. at least from, from my perspective, is what would, what would distinguish ministry from just being a compassionate, loving human being, which is, you know, on some level or another, I mean, you could argue that there's no need for a distinction, but then why are we in the church, right? Um, well, I think, I think naming it ministries for our, our, our own sake, so that we're more aware of what it is that we're doing. Um, there's, there was this guy that was uh, addicted to heroin, and uh, and he just couldn't kick it, you know. And he's, and he's the younger brother of a very famous gang leader in Chicago, uh, but he's with a rival gang, and so everybody always protected him because, you know, this is this is the young brother of our biggest rival, you know, and he's a good guy. So what do they do? They 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 spoke to his mom and said, "Listen, we're going to go into the basement. We're going to clear everything out." We're gonna board up the windows. We're gonna put a sleeping bag, a mattress, a bunch of water down there, some snacks, whatever. And we're gonna kidnap your son and we're gonna stick him in, in the basement. And they detoxed them that way. Cold detox. Just literally just, you know. And they told them, they said, oh, we're gonna go downstairs. You know, we're gonna have a little meeting. Yeah, 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 no doubt, no doubt. They're like, they're like, well, you go down first since you know where the lights are, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. He runs down the stairs, clicks on the light. Boom, he closed the door behind him, you know? And, uh, and you know, he, he tore up that basement. Yeah. Whatever was in that basement, he tore it up. Uh, he threw every bottle of water at the door. He didn't have any water for four days. That could have killed him. Isn't that quite dangerous? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's, oh, yeah, absolutely. It's extraordinarily dangerous. Uh, but when I spoke to one of the guys about, about why they did it and how did you know he was going to survive, I figured he would. He survived everything else. Why wouldn't he survive this? Okay. In my mind, 
I'm saying, well, God ordained you to do it. Not because it's a dude and, you know, we got to take them, but because he's your brother and you feel him that way. And there was nobody else that was going to do it because if he didn't do it, he was going to end up on the street dead at some point, you know. Uh, and it was ordained for him to do that. It was his thought, this one individual, it was his thought to get that done. Now, if he's aware that he was ordained by God to do that, and then acts on it, then that's where it becomes a ministry, and we have to identify it as a ministry because this is something you're going to keep doing. You know, and that's that's the way I view it. You know, that's that's you know, because everybody always asks me, so what's your ministry? <laughs> I'm like, he does it for other people. Uh, right. And his ministry is I throw people in the basements and Right. I mean I mean if that's something that you're gonna help people do is overcome addiction, okay. then then we have to well that is your ministry. Okay. You're gonna help people overcome addictions, you know? Um, and but then that's for us to say, okay, this is this is what I'm doing, you know. Um, but it you know, and a lot of these guys out on the street minister to each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> without understanding at all. I mean, you know, there was this one guy that, you know, he was a cocaine addict. And one day he just, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't stay in rehab and he came back to the neighborhood and nobody would help him. And one of the guys said, just give him a lump real quick, just, just so that he can level out. That was ordained as well, because once he, he, he sniffed that and he leveled out, then they were able to talk to him and, hey, bro, you go back to rehab, you know, you, you got to get over this. You know, your mom's over there, she's worried about you, we'll drop you off, you know, this and that, whatever. Of course, with a lot of, like, look, motherfucker, you know, in between, but the, what they ministered to him was a temporary solution and the guidance to get better for whatever reason, selfish or not, you know, that's what they did, you know, and it's, and it's hard for, and I'm not saying this is you or us, but it's hard for